people are out there again. Come on, let's talk to the people. Hi, everybody. Hey, it's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch in Far West Texas, giving you a long shot with a squawking duck. Isn't this pretty? This is my little oasis that's underway. We've been at this for seven years now, and there's a whole lot of people out here with beautiful oases that are much prettier than this, but this is what we've been able to do. And you're looking past the moringa trees onto some of our desert trees. And the moringa trees, of course, is what we're here to talk about today. You know, when Debbie and I moved out here, we didn't give a lot of thought to water. Uh, we just knew we wanted to live in the desert, and we figured, well, you know, I'm handy enough that I'll figure out a way for us to live within our av available water means. So that's what we've had to do. But I discovered the moringa tree, and I started last year doing several videos on it, and I did quite a few pictures. I even did a demonstration for our local um, festival called The Green Scene about the wonders and the health benefits and just the food benefits of these trees. And this is a follow-up for 2017 of what our trees are doing this year. Now in the frame here you can see the Moringa trees, this side and this side of me. This is part of our Moringa forest. These were 14 trees last year that grew up and believe it or not, this one here got to be 14 feet high before the cold uh, came in and it went dormant. Now total last year we probably had 20, 25 to 30 trees that got up to any kind of height. We were able to harvest those trees when the weather turned, when we were expecting our first frost sometime in November. And I say frost, I don't mean frost, our first below 40 degree night, which is when they go into dormancy. Um, we were able to harvest them all. Now, if you don't harvest them and they start to go dormant, what happens is all the chlorophyll is going to go back down the tree and you're going to lose the benefits of having the chlorophyll up here. That's why you want to harvest them. You get all the benefit of all the nutrients. We hang it upside down and let it dry. We don't let it dry on the tree because all the chlorophyll and half the goodness is going to go out. So, last year, when we harvested the 25 to 30 trees, and we processed the powder, we got something like seven, about seven pounds of powder. And we're still, Debbie still uses that powder every day as opposed to the fresh leaves because she prefers the taste of the powder. So we'll make the powder again this year, only we'll have quite a bit more. But last year when I grew these trees, I planted the trees from seed on May 2nd. And by November they had grown up, but I didn't have any real seed pods on them. I didn't plant a single tree this year. We're going to walk around and look at this forest in a moment. I didn't plant a single tree this year. Every single tree that I'm about to show you came back from the roots. We're in zone 8B and they're like a zone 9 plant. So we didn't mulch the roots, we didn't do anything. The plants died back and they came right up from the roots and they actually started about um, oh the 10th of April kind of. Uh, when they came up. So that's a three week jump start over the seeds. And of course, because it was coming from uh, root, they came up better. Mm. Now, another thing we're doing this year, and I'm going to get a close up and show you. Now, another thing we're doing this year that we didn't do last year is I'm actually cutting the branches in the tops so that they will split and regrow. It's, it's much the same uh, technique as you'd use with tomatoes or something. But these little shoots right here above my hand, you cut those shoots. Now, if you try to eat them raw, I find they're quite bitter. Some of you that have done this may not find them bitter. But I find them quite bitter. But if they blanch for just a minute or two in, in water or soup or whatever, there's absolutely no bitterness. Now, where it goes, I don't have a clue. But I've been able to harvest these myself exclusively. Uh, for my, um, I put it in my ramen noodles um, every day at lunchtime, and uh, of course it's very nutritious. They have um, a taste, especially if you're getting these these really green leaves uh, stems, like this one. See how that bends so easily? Those real green stems, you can eat those down until they start to really stiffen up, and they have a taste of a very very mild asparagus to them. But I've been able to just harvest the tips and let these continue to bush out and bush out. And these, and, um, these are bushier now. 
but we've also had a hotter summer this year we've actually had a normal summer this year and last year was a bit cool so now the breeze is coming up a little bit right now and i don't know if it's going to oh here's cascade the wonder dog people ask me what's so wonderful about him well i don't know he's just my dog so he's wonderful but he is the guardian. He keeps all the coyotes away from here. At any rate, get out of the frame. At any rate, what we didn't get last year out of our moringa trees were a lot of, we didn't get any mature seed pods. They came out, but they ended up about this big right here in November, and that wasn't good for anything. Now, these are edible right here, people. We'll eat these right like this. And I don't know what the flavor is. It seems to me I remember someone saying uh, a bit like asparagus again. This is a, a little bit more mature pod. So we have um, about 15 or 20 pods developing right now, and I'm sure there'll be more coming. Uh, I've noticed this year out here in West Texas that we've had a real lack of pollinators. Now, I don't know if everybody else has noticed that, but I have not had anywhere near the bees out here that um, we usually have. And although I've got all these beautiful blooms, if you've never smelled the fragrance of a Moringa, it is just amazing, beautiful, wonderful fragrance. Uh, but I haven't had the pollinators, so I'm not getting a lot of seed pods. Now, that may be indicative of living in the desert. Um, we're in, like in Star Trek, we're in the undiscovered country here because I've not done this. Uh, and I, there are a lot of people that talk about growing Moringa in arid climates. One of the things about Moringa that makes it such a wonderful food product is the fact that it does grow, uh, particularly in areas that are prone to the monsoon, like um, the Indian subcontinent. And it will grow when, uh, when water is scarce and nothing else is available. It's growing and it's putting out it's putting out the uh, the leaves. Around here we get about 12 inches of rain. That's our average. So we could have a year where we have six inches. We could have a year where we have, um, in fact, we did have a year where we had 30 inches. We're in a normal year now, so I'm expecting anywhere from 12 to 15 inches of rain. They need water. They can't live on no water. They're not a cactus, so they do need some water. And that can be an issue if you're trying to live out here like we are, because our, our, all the water we use is catchment water. Now we do have access to the creek and there's water holes in the creek that seldom dry up and these are called uh, Tanahas down here. So I do have access to water in the Tanahas, but uh, we water these trees with our gray water. Now there's just Debbie and I and so we don't have a lot of gray water out here. Uh, and we have other plants. We do have a lot of cactus which require some water. They don't require a lot. Uh, so we are often using water, good water, sweet water we call it, to, to provide water for these. So you do need water to grow Moringa. You don't need a ton of it, but you need to remember that you have to have some water, particularly when you get into the time of year um, here, which is sometime in um, mid-June to mid-July where the temperature really soars and we hit that 112, 115 degree days for a little while. But it's not a plant that can be grown with no water, but it will thrive with little water and it will produce leaves that are edible that, um, you know, if you're starving, these can save you during, a, uh, during the heat of the summer or during a drought. I said I'd show you my Moringa forest. These are the original 14 trees here. Um, I've got one that died, two that died, three that died. So I've got um, I have about 12 here that are growing. And they, again, came back from root, which is just wonderful. I planted this late in the year. I actually planted this about August of last year, and it grew until November, and we were pretty sure it would die back, but it did come back. Now, it didn't come back real good because we've got little pockets where the soil here is quite barren, and it doesn't even hold nutrients, and we're getting into that a bit here where they're not growing. Now, this cage was just to keep the chickens out. The chickens do not like the taste of fresh Moringa unless it's a fresh sprout. Here's another one. I planted this in September, and uh, this came back again this year. But getting back to chickens, they don't like the fresh Moringa unless it sprouts, and it may be that little taste of bitterness in there. But if you dry the leaves a couple days, they will eat and eat and eat and eat and eat them. They love them. 
So that is a good source. It's 45% protein. And that's a great source for livestock feed also. Uh, I guess cows will eat this just fine. But the chickens, they need it a little dry. These were fresh. I planted from seeds, oh, along about June. Uh, so I did have uh, these two seeds this year, and over here, these two trees that I planted a little out. I planted these probably in May. Uh, again, it was a little barren uh, area, and we had that three-week stretch where we hit 100 and, well, over 107, definitely. Now, the interesting thing that I wanted to be sure and show people, these are just trees that came back, is it come around here like this, when we got all excited, we thought the little Moringas looked like um, that little baby Groot before, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 came out. And um, so I got this little sign. These three trees here are original trees, and in fact, the very first one I planted is this one right here. And it died and came back this year. But notice how small it is compared to all the others. Here and here. So you do need to have a decent soil. They like poor, they'll, they'll do well, well with a poor soil. They won't do well with a sterile soil, and some parts of the desert have sterile soil. And uh, I'm in an area where I've got pockets of sterile and um, um, relatively fertile soil. I still need to augment the soils with some things, and I've got, luckily, chicken manure and horse manure. And I thought I'd show you that because some people have written me that they're not having good luck with the Moringa, and well, I mean, you, you might be in a situation like that right there because that Moringa tree is the very first one that we, that we actually planted in the ground, and it's, uh, what, about four inches high, five inches high. So, what can I tell you personally about the health benefits of Moringa? Not much. I really can't because we try to live as healthy as we can, but we're in an area where, our, where the fruits and vegetables that we get are lousy and very expensive. So our fresh vegetable is in fact the Moringa, and it's one of the very few that we're able to get right now until I get my greenhouse up and growing. You know, I, I have found it very easy since I've included Moringa in my, um, uh, in my diet. And I've done this now since these came back in, uh, in, in, in May is when I was able to start cutting. Uh, I have found it very easy to control my appetite. And believe it or not, actually control a craving for alcohol. I like to drink. I'm not a drunk by any means, but I like to drink. And I was having three and four drinks, sometimes just beer a day. Cut that back. I can go zero or one drinks a day. So it cut back that craving. It also cut back my, um, my appetite quite a bit. And I, you know, got the energy and strength and everything else. So I don't know if it's a what the what benefit that I'm definitely seeing, but I know that that's something that has happened along at the same time that we included moringa in our diet. So I wanted to give you an overview of what we've done with moringa. Uh, we're probably going to increase this forest realistically to about three or four hundred trees. I don't think I can provide the water for more than that. But um, we'll have that, and we'll have the Moringa for us to eat. We'll have powder that we can sell inexpensively to people. Because I've written before, and I might have said this in one of the other videos, about Moringa and all the other superfoods they come out with. The problem with the superfoods, like blue-green algae and, I mean, you name it, pick one, quinoa, things like that, is they, they give you this fantastic sales pitch about how wonderful it is, and then they give you a little jar like this and say, well, that's $25. Well, now the trend now, I hate that word trend, but the trend now is not only are you going to buy the little jar for you know $20, but we're going to put you on a subscription plan, and once a month we're going to send you another jar for $20 plus shipping and handling. Well, that's fine, except that when money gets tight, What's the first thing you cut? All of a sudden you say, you know what, organic vegetables aren't all that great. I don't need moringa trees. Where's the great value? And I want to be able to here provide low cost moringa powder. Now, while it's not going to be $20 a jar, it's still going to be $10 a jar probably. And that gets a little expensive. But the thing I want to do and the thing I'd like to do is educate people on growing these trees. You can grow them almost anywhere. 
as an annual, as a perennial, you do need to be in zone 8 at least. I'm in 8B, but you need to be in zone 8 to grow them as a perennial, and they are going to come back from the bottom. But you can grow them in a pot, a planter, you can grow them in a greenhouse certainly almost anywhere. And if you do like I said, now this one here I'm letting grow again. This was my 14 footer last year. But if you do like I said and cut off the tops, not only do you have a delicious meal, but you're also promoting more growth. So that's something you can do. You can do it in Michigan, you can do it in Manitoba, or you can do it down here in beautiful Terlingua. So that's about all I've got to say about the Moringa trees. However, I do want to show you some of the um, plants we're starting right now and uh, a donation that we got from someone to uh, help with our greenhouse. Well, you got to look through chicken wire and I'm not sure you can see. But um, what I'm growing in this container, this is a horse trough, are water chestnuts. Now these water chestnuts, if you're on the east coast, these are not the invasive ones that they're trying to get rid of and, and um, uh, tell you, oh no, 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 they're a horrible thing. These are the uh, water chestnuts that, that you'd buy in an Asian market or in the cans that say water chestnuts for 99 cents each. Um, the invasive ones, by the way, are extremely edible and if you're in an area that's just overrun by them, you can, you can harvest those and, and uh, peel the, um, uh, peel the uh, skins and uh, or you can grate take a, 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 a rough grater and grate the skins right off of them and you have a you have a very nutritious snack there and you're helping to pull stuff out of the um, invasive species out of the water now in here is another invasive species called Kang Kong and I'm gonna go over and show you the Kang Kong that are a little older now this is more what Kang Kong looks like um, Kang Kong is also an invasive. If it gets loose in, a, you know, in, in I, I would almost say anywhere from North Carolina south in waterways, it can be a real issue, a real problem. Around here it needs water to grow, so it's pretty much stuck. I've got it growing in this container in the middle. It's, uh, it, along with the water chestnut, is a um, perimeter plant, so it'll grow around the perimeters of ponds and um, lakes. Um, slow, slow-moving creeks and rivers too. They don't like fast water. Uh, very nutritious, grows very, very fast. Uh, I would just tell you that you've probably eaten it if you've ever eaten at a Chinese restaurant. And I would tell you just um, if you can get a hold of a couple seeds, grow a couple, get them up to about this size and um, cut them off. Do a little tiny stir fry with them and see if you like the taste of them. You can eat them raw, but you'll want to grow your own in an environment like this to, to um, eat them raw because there is some kind of a danger. I, I don't know the danger. You'd have to look it up. But to an aquatic vegetable eaten raw, there is some kind of a danger. Now also, we decided to try water lotus. Now here is one of our lotuses. It's just opening up um, a lily. Now, water lotus is different than water lily. Water lotus, the leaves and the flowers are going to always be above the water, where lilies are going to be on the water. I know lotus is edible. I have not looked into lily. Um, but this is a plant that is less than two weeks old, and you can see it's over a foot long, and it's got a, a lily pad on it. I've got a couple of more over here. And I've got uh, four more that are trying to grow in the, um, in the house, as well as more seeds coming because water lotus is highly edible. It's probably something that if you've eaten in a, a, a high-end Chinese restaurant, not one of those that, that uh, does all that prepackaged um, buffet crap, but a high-end Chinese restaurant, you have more than likely had water lotus. Uh, and I want to show you a little bit more because in the desert here we're going to have a water garden. And I want to show you a little bit about that water garden before I end this. So I signed the Eco Ranch up for farm stay programs. And I don't know if anyone knows them, but uh, uh, I'll tell you where you can go and look at them and find out information. You can go to um, www.oof.net. I believe it's net. You can go to helpx. It's either .com or .net, and you can go to HelpX, H-E-L-P-X, or you can go to workaway.info. Uh, we signed up for that, and our very first person that came out here, very lovely Japanese student, 
We had a little bit of a miscommunication. I was trying to explain to him that we have a vein of sand that I use here for all my mortar work because we're building this whole compound here out of empty discarded glass bottles because there is no recycling out where we are and native rock. Well, I want to use that which is a good vein of good fine sand with a little bit of clay in it that makes an excellent, real strong mortar. So I told him to dig in here and follow the vein. And he did, straight down. He didn't know what the vein was. So here I end up with this big hole. I go, what am I gonna do with this hole? Well, that's how we end up with the water lilies and the water chest, I mean the water lotus and the uh, water chestnuts and the Kang Kong. And there's more vegetables that you can grow. Well, we've already got a pond started here, so he didn't make a mistake. He just um, knew what I wanted before I knew. So in here, I want to show you what we're going to do here. What you're looking at here, I called it a donation. It was a giveaway. Somebody wanted to get rid of it because they weren't going to use it. What this is, is it's the bottom one-third of a 3,000 or 2,500 gallon black water tank. These are what we use out here to store our water, particularly if you're on catchment. And now with so many people doing rainwater harvesting, everybody's got, I say everybody, a lot of people have tanks like this. So someone, and not the people I got it from, but someone decided to cut this off and they were going to make, I imagine, um, a swimming pool out of it, which it's nice. It's nine feet, uh, excuse me, eight feet in diameter. It makes a nice swimming pool. Except they found out, as did the person that gave it to me, that when you fill it with water, first of all, we don't have enough water to spare out here for a swimming pool. You fill it with water, the sides start pulling out and pulling out and pulling out, or going in like this, and you're going to lose the water. So it needs to be reinforced. So she said, well, I want to get rid of it. Well, I got that hole I just showed you, and that hole is almost the perfect size to put this in. Now, I do have to shore the outside up with uh, uh, concrete that, and, and I've got concrete that I can pour around the, the edges um, and it'll take me probably three weeks uh, to pour the concrete around the edges because I use the concrete or the mortar mix that's left over at the end of the day. It makes a weak, weak concrete or mortar. But, and I say weak, it's not as strong as it should be, it's still strong. But um, I'll pour it around the sides, that'll keep the sides from going out, and I will have to make a crisscross in the bottom and a crisscross in the top to just hold the sides out. Crisscross will be made out of PVC pipe. Very simple. Line the edges with rock, and I've got a pond. Well, now what do you do with the pond? Well, I'm somebody that hates fads. I just hate. If it's trending, I'm not going to do it. If everybody's doing it, you can be sure I'm not. But the, the fad seems to be to go to aquaponics. Now, aquaponics is, is ancient, and we've done aquaponics probably as long as we've done any kind of agriculture, which take your pick from, I happen to think it's 200,000 years, and I, I've got backing for that, but even if it's only eight or 9,000 years, we've done aquaponics. So aquaponics is just a fancy, uh, a fancy name for growing fish and using the fish water to fertilize your plants with. So for aquaponics, this is a perfect fish tank. Now out here, I think about all I can grow is tilapia. Perfect fish tank. Put it in the ground, line it, make it pretty. It's a fish tank. Well then, I won't go into the whole process, but aquaponics, I'm going to start here with um, uh, four inch tubes using net pots that have a constant, um, a constant film of water flowing through them. Then I'm going to use the um, flood and drain beds, that that water will flow into the flood and drain beds. Then way over here, um, actually not too far, but way over here, I'm going to have a rather large water vegetable garden, which will have the Kang Kong and the water lotuses in it, and a couple of water lilies that I think are very pretty uh, for the beauty factor. A little creek running between it, a little patio right here to sit on. So it'll be a dual purpose kind of an area here. That'll be in different videos as we come up. But um, I just thought I'd run that by and show you. I was real excited to get this because the more I looked at it, the more I found that it was an absolutely perfect fish tank. So that's what we're going to use it for. And with that, I hope those of you that um, tuned in to what, see the Moringa presentation, I hope you got something from that. And I hope I didn't bore anybody too much. I usually do and I get a troll or two. But hey, if people don't hate you, 
then you're doing something wrong because everybody can't love everybody. So with that, guys, it's Robert Earl out here at the Eco Ranch in beautiful far west Texas saying see you later.